Good evening. I'm Russell Gruen, Dean of the ANU College of Health and Medicine. I'm joining you from the land of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, the traditional owners of the Canberra region, and where the main campus of our national university is based. And on behalf of the university, I celebrate and pay our respects to them and to all First Nations Australians on whose lands we're meeting tonight, whose cultures are amongst the oldest continuing cultures in human history. We come together today for the annual ANU lecture in psychology. I'm joined by the director of the Research School of Psychology, Professor Ian Walker, and this year's guest lecturer, Jane Holton. I'm sure most of you are very familiar with Jane's distinguished career, and in case you aren't, Ian will introduce her shortly. I suspect not all of you would know that Jane is a psychology honours graduate of ANU. And I remember a discussion during which she said to me, there hasn't been a day go by that I haven't been grateful for what I learned in psychology at ANU. I took note, never has an alumni program got off to such a good start. The annual lecture is a highlight of our year, especially this year as we celebrate both the 75th anniversary of our national university and the 70th year of psychology at ANU. In 1946, ANU was established to be an intellectual powerhouse for nation building, generating the knowledge and preparing the leaders to guide Australia through the great challenges of the post-war years. It is a mission and purpose that certainly still resonates 75 years later. Mid-century psychology was a relatively young academic discipline, especially in Australian universities. ANU Psychology began in 1949 as part of the Canberra University College, and it was primarily a teaching unit. My, how that has changed. Amalgamation with general studies at ANU in the early 60s brought growth in student numbers, diversified course offerings, and increased research capacity. Professor Cecil Gibb, the first professor of psychology and head of school, was anxious for psychology to receive its due recognition as a scientific discipline and positioned it as having the, the potential to be equally as important to society as the physical sciences, but also to remedy the problems wrought by the physical sciences. His legacy has persisted through many transformations over the years and ANU has built strength and leadership in most areas of the field, but especially social psychology, experimental psychology, and clinical psychology. In recent years, the Research School of Psychology has provided our nation with research capacity amongst the best in the world, and education vital for our future. It has continued to support national unity and identity and improve our understanding of ourselves and our neighbours. And in the last two years, the need has never been greater. Experts in clinical and social psychology at ANU are uncovering the individual and collective impact of the bushfire and pandemic crises. The needs of our communities in our region and around the world. The importance of accurate and timely information. The fascinating phenomena around what is true, what are facts and what constitutes evidence, what underpin beliefs, what people are experiencing and what determines their behaviour. A terrific example of the impact of our psychologists is the emergency response to support the mental health needs of our local communities in southern New South Wales and to support psychologists working with bushfire affected communities around Australia, which won the ANU Bushfire Impact Working Group, the Public Health Association's Sydney Sachs Award for Public Health in late 2020. And this is just one example of so many impactful contributions from psychology over the last two years. For all the work that so many of you have contributed directly to keeping Australia safe and sane, we owe you a debt of gratitude. Psychology has been at the core of much of the necessary expertise for us to survive and thrive. Today's lecture is both a reflection of progress to date and the challenges of the future. The university is committed to ANU psychology, and now is a great time to take stock 
and reflect on what's been achieved in the 70 years and through the pandemic and to think about the future. If the global pandemic has done nothing else, it's made us really sharpen our thinking and our vision for what is needed in the world going ahead. Many things have changed, not least higher education, the way academics work, what students expect and experience, the research we do, and the value that society and governments place in it. Never has it been clearer to society the importance of psychology and the inseparability and interdependence of physical health, mental health, public health, human experience, and human behavior. The university has taken a bold step by bringing psychology and medicine alongside each other. This is in no way to detract from either, but to celebrate their interrelatedness as well as their independence. In doing so, the university will ensure psychology as a discipline continues to thrive, as it will medicine. It also gives opportunity for integrating the sciences that make us up as whole people, as beings that perceive, process and express. It is a timely step in a world ready, even hungry, for an institution committed, as our motto says, to first understanding the nature of things, understanding us as human beings. And as our history is embraced, to then provide leadership and prepare the leaders who are going to make a difference. It's unimaginable to have a great university without great psychology. Today we celebrate it with a wonderful lecture and I look forward to championing it going forward. I now hand over to you, Ian, as Director of the Research School of Psychology. Thank you very much, Russell. Let me start with a couple of housekeeping notes. Uh, first, uh, please note the lecture is being recorded so we can post it on various media afterwards. And second, we, there'll be a Q&A period for perhaps 10 minutes at the end of the lecture. If you do have a question, please use the chat function or raise your hand. So as Russell mentioned, psychology at the ANU is celebrating its 70th year in the same year that the ANU is celebrating its 75th anniversary. In that time, psychology has graduated thousands of students, many of whom, like tonight's speaker, have gone on to distinguish careers. Psychology has also had, and it still has, many outstanding, internationally renowned research scientists in many different areas of psychology. Tonight's lecture is the latest and impressive list of distinguished psychology public lectures. Most recently, we've had lectures from Professor Steve Riker from the University of St Andrews last year, talking about his experiences as part of the UK government's SAGE team advising on its COVID response. Professor Beth Loftus from the University of California, talking of her work on memory and eyewitness testimony in the legal system. And Professor Pat Dudgeon from UWA uh, and Australia's first indigenous psychologist, talking of trauma in indigenous communities. Tonight's lecture is about pandemics and the role of psychology. The COVID pandemic, like all pandemics, involves a virus, but a virus doesn't make a pandemic. A virus becomes a pandemic because of the ways we humans act and organize ourselves. A pandemic is fun fundamentally about human behavior. Similarly, our way out of the current pandemic involves much more than developing a vaccine. It requires enough people to take the vaccine and to change the way we behave. Pandemic management requires much more than following health advice. Su success or failure relies on global co cooperation, how fast we respond, how ready we are, and how engaged and compliant citizens are. So when it comes to prevention, preparedness, politics and pandemics, where does psychology fit? And that's the focus of tonight's lecture to be given by Jane Holton. The Canberra Times referred to Jane as the most powerful female public servant in Australian history. She was awarded an Order of Australia in 2015, which appears to be something that runs in the family with both her father and grandfather, a member of the same order. She has had a distinguished career in public administration, particularly in the health and aged care sectors. 
Her 33-year career within the Australian Public Service included nearly 15 years as Secretary of the Departments of Finance and Health and Health and Aging, and included a stint as the Executive Coordinator of the Department of the Prime Minister and Cabinet. She has developed and implemented public policy and provided advice to government on issues including the administration of Medicare, the pharmaceutical benefits scheme, aged care, and private health insurance. Jane has held a number of significant roles in global health governance, including as a board member and chair of the board of the World Health Organization, uh, at the OECD as chair of the health committee and as chair and president of the World Health Assembly. Jane is chair of the International Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations and is co-chair of the COVAX coordination mechanism, which combines the buying power of all nations and acts as a global hub for buying and distributing vaccines. Notably, as Russell mentioned, Jane is a psychology honours graduate of the ANU. I'm also delighted tonight to announce that Jane is now, as of late yesterday, and as awarded by the Vice-Chancellor, an honorary professor of the university, affiliated with the School of Psychology. This is in recognition of her major and ongoing contributions to public administration and leadership, especially in health through her roles in the Commonwealth Government, CLU, CEPI, and others, and to facilitate her future contributions to the university in developing expertise in health leadership and in championing engagement with influential alumni. So on that note, it's my pleasure and privilege to introduce tonight's speaker, Professor Jane Halton, to speak on the topic of prevention, preparedness, politics, and pandemics. Where does psychology fit? And to you, Jane. And thank you to both Ian and Russell, and can I say I'm very honoured by the appointment, but I think it's in the category of there's no such thing as a free lunch. So I'm looking forward to making a contribution to the faculty and to the student body. Can I also start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on uh, which we all sit and meet um, and pay my respects to their elders past present and emerging and a particular recognition to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander person who is joining us today. I would particularly, of course, acknowledge the Ngunnawal and the Ngambri people. It seems somehow fitting that this lecture was meant to be in person, but COVID uh, willing or not, we are therefore doing this remotely. It's a kind of nice underscore, I think, of the lives many of us have lived since early in 2020. And much as the you're on mute should be the t-shirt of the pandemic, I think, however, we need to acknowledge that the experience of the pandemic is much more than constantly sitting in Zoom, uh, etc. meetings. And what I'd like to do is start, if I might, by just reading you the first little stanza of a poem. And I'm going to tell you who wrote it and when they wrote it at the end. Does this sound resonant given our circumstance? Oh, how shall I its deeds recount or measure the untold amount of ills that it has done? From China's bright celestial land, e'en to Arabia's thirsty sand, it journeyed with the sun. More to come of that later. And I think the point I wish to make by starting with that, and I'll conclude with it, is that pandemics are not new. I suspect Regardless of how poor the history education some of us may have had, I don't need to explain the notion of plague in the 14th century and the complete devastation that it wrought. Interestingly, some suspect that it then generated a whole series of innovation, but the personal cost has echoed down the ages. Then, of course, the so-called Spanish flu. 1918 to 1920. And depending on how you measure 
these things and recognising that civil re registration around the world, much as today, was not very good. But it was possibly up to 100 million people who died of the so-called Spanish flu. It's worth noting that is more people than died in World War I and World War II combined. The Asian flu in 1957-58, where a million people died, and in the US alone, 120,000. And then more recently, H1N1, swine flu, which started in Mexico, and by the time it had finished, 1.4 billion people had been infected, underscoring how rapidly and how pervasive a virus can be. Now, fortunately, that particular pandemic, so it was global, but it was not as lethal as former uh, prior pandemics, killing, we think, of the order of 500,000 people. But notably, the majority of those deaths were in young people. And as the Secretary of the Federal Department of Health at the time of that pandemic, uh, the almost daily discussion about how many young people, including young women who were pregnant, were in intensive care and on what's called ECMO, uh, still I can hear the real concern in people's voices. And so while flu has been a significant feature of the world's experience of pandemics, other pathogens, of course, have been and continue to be a problem. And it is the case that the world has expected pandemic flu and severe pandemic flu for a significant number of years. But we've had warning signs about these other pathogens. SARS, which disrupted uh, activity in Asia in particular, um, spread to North America, which mercifully was able to be brought to a conclusion quickly, did not develop into a global pandemic because of the need for you to be symptomatic as in order to be infectious. So you could see it and therefore bring it to a conclusion. MERS, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, some very nasty outbreaks similarly brought under control. And then another virus, which many of you may not have heard of, the Nipah virus. Again, fast acting public health, but also uh, acute health people in Kerala, in India, brought what could have been a very nasty outbreak to a conclusion. So we know, and we have known forever, that the risk to human health of uh, a virus, most likely we thought an influenza virus, but not solely an influenza virus, is there. We've also known that the circumstances that actually are the precursors for a virus to actually have a zoonotic event, in other words, to translate from an animal reservoir into human beings and then to become a virus of concern, we've known that the precursors to this have been evident for some time. The amount of wild habitat in the world is decreasing. The One Health community have been warning us for many years about the risk that we run from these kind of zoonotic events. And regardless of what you think of the Wuhan lab leak theory, the truth of the matter is there is more risk today than there ever has been in the past from these viruses, these pathogens of concern in respect of potential pandemic. And of course, pandemics can and do have profound effects. The effects are clearly on human health, on lives, livelihoods, well-being on mental health, on the operation of the global economy and of domestic economies. Their effects are local, they're national, they are global, and they are profound. They create long-standing grievances. And it's worth just pausing for a second to reflect on an announcement made 
by the then New Zealand Prime Minister, Helen Clark, in 2002, where she apologised to the people of Samoa for, during the colonial era, the behaviour of a New Zealand harbour master who let into the harbour and then let disembark the passengers from a ship that had travelled from the west coast of the United States. That ship, which had been placed in quarantine in earlier ports with passengers not allowed to disembark, that ship, of course, brought with it influenza. And that influenza outbreak in Samoa took the lives of 22% of the entire Samoan population. So some tens of generations and years afterwards, the need to apologise for the profound impact of that particular incident was sufficient that a Prime Minister would apologise to the peoples of another nation. So notwithstanding everything we know, everything we've seen, and everything we understand about pandemics, here we are again. So far, five million deaths. If you add excess mortality, and of course that is the number of deaths which you have not been directly attributed to COVID, but are above the number of deaths that you would expect in a given period, and depending on the country and the quality of the civil registration system, in many countries, it is anticipated when the numbers are finally tallied, that the number in excess of the official statistic will be somewhere between 50 and 200%. So whilst we say at the moment, the death toll from COVID is 5 million globally, we know that that is a significant underestimate. On the good news front, 6.9 million doses, billion doses of vaccine have been administered. Now it's worth remembering that when I tell you that close to 50% of the world's population have had at least one dose and that 2.5 million doses of vaccine are being administered every day, but it's worth remembering that that is very much a story of the have and the have nots. In low income countries, a grand total, on average, of 3.1% of people have had one dose. And it's worth remembering that with a population of 8 billion or thereabouts around the world, and in an environment where we anticipate that there will be a vaccine approved for use in very young children, we might as well say for the benefit of rough numbers that we will need 16 billion doses of vaccine to give everyone around the world the same first level of cover. And this, this is as we commence on boosters. And I must say, I feel deeply uncomfortable when I talk with my colleagues and my friends in a range of overseas countries about this enormous inequity. It's worth reminding ourselves that the cost of this pandemic is absolutely enormous. By some estimates, it's close to 4 trillion US dollars to date. And even if that number is a gross overestimate of 100% on anyone's, anyone's uh, calculus, trillions of dollars of impact is a huge number. But what it hides is the personal cost, the local impact, the anguish, the impact on trade and on travel, the disruption to lives, the mental health and the other health consequences. So why are we here again? But actually, it's worse. We're not just here again from where we have been. It is worse than where we have been in the past. Because we're now in a world where the media cycle is 24 seven. We have never before had a pandemic in a context where social media is so all pervasive, where rumors, misstatements, conspiracy theories and outright lies abound 
And sadly, people are all too willing, apparently, to believe Joe on Twitter, as opposed to Paul Kelly, the chief medical officer, about the efficacy, the reliability, and the desirability of being vaccinated. Sadly, in this pandemic, we've seen vaccine nationalism. We've seen hoarding, and I'm not just talking about toilet paper. We've seen the hoarding by countries of masks, ventilators, and vaccines. And we've seen shortages. So why have we failed to prepare? Why have we failed to prevent this kind of uh, outbreak? And of course, the answer is very complex. We're talking about global systems. We're talking about uh, the reality of mobilizing across many countries. And whilst we have said constantly during this pandemic, we are all in this together. Well, you know what? We're not. We're all this, in this together when we all think that there is scant access to one commodity and we play nice. But as soon as one or two parties have actually gotten preferential access to necessary products, most particularly vaccines, but not just vaccines, um, then we see uh, a group of people standing around thinking, I feel okay, it's actually improving here. They behave like bystanders. Does this sound familiar? This is not like we're on a plane and you should put your own mask on first. The truth of the matter is we're on the same plane. The fact some of us are in business class and some of us are down the back in economy doesn't mean that everyone shouldn't get the oxygen mask at the same time. So the world has had mixed to poor outcomes. And the truth of the matter is, whilst we've learned some things about preparation, we haven't done enough. The Global Prevention Monitoring Board, which launched its third report last night at the Berlin World Health Summit, I was very honoured to be a discussant as part of that launch, actually takes the world to task for what we haven't done. We haven't put in place financing mechanisms to ensure we can rapidly deliver equitable access to vaccines. We haven't delivered the funding and the systems to monitor and to intervene early to prevent these kinds of outcomes. And we haven't uh, actually ensured that poor, low to middle income um, countries actually have the same capacity to identify, to track and respond to these sorts of outbreaks. On the good news front, the Ebola crisis in West Africa, known to all of us, has led to some actions. And the World Bank, which did a lot of work on this particular issue, recommended a series of measures, not all of which have been adopted. One of which, however, is that there should be an investment in global science to actually develop candidate vaccines against priority pathogens. And I can say that CEPI, the organisation of which I am very privileged to be the chair of the board, is the outcome of that particular recognition. Our priority, our task, our mandate has been to invest in vaccine development for priority pathogens, the kind of pathogens we should all worry about, in anticipation that then those vaccines would be able to be scaled rapidly and then delivered equitably around the world. Little did we think some 18 months into our operation that we would be confronting a pandemic. Our first investments as part of the pandemic were made in early January of 2020, when there were less than 600 diagnosed cases. And I can tell you that one of the first pathogens we had invested in in 2019 was, drum roll, coronavirus. I'm also very proud that we have been part of the COVAX initiative. In fact, we were an initial designer of the COVAX initiative. But we have struggled to get the vaccines equitably distributed around the world. And of course, 
uh, as people have waited for clarity, as we've waited for someone else to fix it, I think I see another bystander here. What has happened is the first world has pulled ahead as the developing world, low to middle income countries have been left behind. In Africa, with less than 3% of people having had even one dose, this is a tragedy. And let's not think that this is not close to home for us. In Papua New Guinea, the numbers are the same. So does this sound familiar? In a crisis, it's more difficult to mobilise. It's hard to know what to do. And a lot of people stand around with their arms crossed, kind of looking the other way. So the question about how we get uh, people to respond to this reminds me of all those lessons I learned all those years ago in the ANU school. We have to get more pro-social behaviour from global leaders. We have to actually demonstrate helping behaviours. We have to create the personal relationships that, that we then use to encourage greater participation. And we have to acknowledge that others are deserving of help. But a charity model, sadly, it still is. And whilst we have done well um, as COVAX in delivering 400 million doses, this will be, we've got 780 million doses committed at the moment to uh, go to 145 countries. The truth of the matter is, we will only scale up to around the billion number towards the end of the year. This is as other countries are basically rolling out boosters. Of course, not all countries have done well in this pandemic, notwithstanding their access to vaccines. And I do think it's important that we focus on leadership as a part of our response and the importance of taking an evidence-based approach. And Russell talked at the outset, and I thought he stole all of my thunder, when he talked about the importance of evidence, and he talked about the importance not, not just of medical advice and medical input into the management of this pandemic. We truly have, in Australia, um, had an evidence-based approach, and we have truly had cross-discipline collaboration. But in other countries, I think this has been less so. And it's hard to rally the globe if there isn't a global consensus. We've known this for years when we've tried to rally the globe on things like antimicrobial resistance. When you're down to only one or two antibiotics to treat some very difficult and persistent illnesses, you would think it would be easier to get a consensus, but no. Animal husbandry, crucial in the SARS outbreak. Again, difficult to get people to change behaviours. And just as I've already mentioned in respect of early warning systems, getting those implemented, notwithstanding the demonstrated benefit from actually being able to bring outbreaks under control, we still struggle. We still have bystanders. We still have crisis mentality, we still have an absence of clarity, and we certainly have no global consensus. But going from the global to the local, let's have a think about how actions have been undertaken, what's been successful, and where have we seen good actions as part of this pandemic. We know that COVID adherence is complex. We know that the policy and messaging that people uh, have used, particularly in the political context, those things are not separate. And some countries have been highly political in their messaging about COVID. Now, I really want to underscore, I am not here talking about Australia. I would acknowledge the commitment to taking evidence-based advice in Australia, and notwithstanding the challenge we have, um, with the overarching uh, 
challenge of vaccine hesitancy, which we should acknowledge is not just one thing. But in other countries, what have we seen? We know that what you do is a powerful signal. And do as I say, but not as I do, is not the right recipe for adherence. We know that protective behaviours are mod moderated by perceived threat. And if you think the risk is low or diminishing, behaviours that you might take to address that threat decrease or cease. We know that trusted sources of information are vital. And we know, including from evidence in the psychology discipline from to the 2009 pandemic, that attitudes are really important in protective behaviours. We know that preventative behaviours, hygiene and, hygiene and mask wearing, are fundamental. We know that avoidance is important, staying at home, quarantining when told to. And we know that adherence to medicines and prescriptions about treatment, and that includes vaccines, are important. And we know that some psychological attributes make you more likely to actually comply. And those lessons are very clear from H1N1. We also know that if you perceive yourself to be susceptible, then you're more likely to carry out prevention and preventative actions. We know that if you worry and you're distressed, that you're going to be more compliant. And certainly, the severity of the disease and your perception about the severity of the disease makes you more compliant. And the behaviour that you might be told to adopt, if you think it's efficacious, again, you're more likely to adopt. But then importantly, the costs of those behaviours become important. The greater the perceived cost, the lower the likelihood of carrying them out. And that includes practical barriers. If there are practical barriers to behaving in the way uh, that's prescribed, be it time, be it emotional, be it distance, be it cost, then you're less likely to comply. If you have a fear of a side effect, you're less likely to comply. So social norms, your knowledge, the cues to action, and your anxiety, and your perception about the commentators and their motivations and their reliability. These things are all fundamental and we know this from evidence. So we actually have to think about what we've seen in this pandemic. And I think we are allowed to form some judgments. So let's just focus very briefly on two issues. The first of which is mask wearing and the second of which is vaccinations. Now, in some countries, and I've already emphasised, I'm not talking about Australia here, notwithstanding what we've seen in respect amongst some groups about vaccines. But in some countries, the very act of wearing a mask has become politicised. I'm sure we've all seen the images of people having their masks ripped off, of people standing in front of somebody else unmasked, shouting aggressively. And whilst we've seen a little bit of that behaviour here, you can actually plot the likelihood of those behaviours in some of these other countries by political affiliation and by geography. It hasn't helped us that experts have been, certainly at the beginning, and I'm talking here about the WHO, have been unclear. They were slow to mandate masks and they were unclear about the advice. And if you go back to what I talked about earlier in terms of the importance of clarity for compliance, you'll understand why this is so important. Mask wearing, some experts said, including one of whom said this to me very early on when I was advocating the use of masks, uh, this person said to me, no, 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 no. There's no evidence for mask wearing. And we think that people will not comply with the other behaviours we're advocating. In other words, 
uh, what this person was saying to me was there would be risk compensation. Now, we know that is not true. We know that physical signs um, actually remind people of what they need to do comp to comply. And we know, we know, and let's be honest, we wear masks during surgery when doing other minor tasks for a reason that masks are effective. And indeed, some people say they're about as effective if they're worn properly with proper hygiene as one dose of vaccine. But it's curious that this anti-mask sentiment is not new. And if you look at the anti-mask league uh, that was prevalent in San Francisco in 1919, there will be a strange resonance to their arguments. What we know about behaviour is crucial if we're to make these uh, measures effective and if they're to be implemented. And finally, to vaccines. In Australia, at the early uh, outset, because of reasons we're all aware of, vaccine uptake was slow to begin with. But as I have said to Russell on several occasions and to others too, I've always said, we'll kind of be a bit jumbled to begin with, and then we will come home highly, highly effectively. We'll make a fantastic finish. And that's what we're seeing with vaccine uptake in Australia, which I'm delighted about. Uh, we now rank with the UK. We have outpaced the US and Germany. We have outpaced a number of countries that we would see as our comparators, but we are not done yet. Vaccine momentum continues. And that is fantastic. And I'd like to remind you that the thing about vaccines is we now take for granted that they're available. But when this started, when I first started talking about vaccines publicly, we had never had a human coronavirus vaccine. And we did not know whether we would be successful. And these vaccines, their first objective is to prevent severe disease and death. And both the vaccines we have used here and now Moderna all do that highly effectively. So what do we know about the motivators and getting people to turn up? We know they have to understand the threat. We know they have to understand the need. They have to be able to access those factors I talked about before. They have to trust the information that they've been provided and we have to counter misinformation. And social marketing, which is another way of saying psychology on a stick, is fundamental to the actual delivery of those uh, messages. I don't know how many of you watch the Grow and Transfer on a weekly basis, where we have a bunch of amateur psychologists talking about how to convince people to do things they haven't thought of previously. Australia has a very proud history in social marketing. It's one of the things I particularly enjoyed in my time as Secretary of the Federal Health Department, working on social marketing in respect of all manner of issues, particularly uh, anti-smoking and a whole series of other uh, things. We are, very, we are world renowned for this work. So the question I posed, and Russell stole my thunder about, where is psychology in all of this? The answer is easy, it's everywhere. It's from nudges, it's from clarity of communication, it's from the work that's been done on mental health, it's from the work that's been done on encouraging people to access vaccines. It's on the work that is being done every day to bring us to the end of the acute phase of this pandemic. But we need to do more. We need to do more in prevention, preparedness, and we need to think about the next time this happens. Because if we don't stamp out the bystander effect, if we don't have purpose and get global consensus, Nothing is sure, but that this will happen again. So let me go back to my poem, which I started on. And I won't read you the whole thing because it's quite long. So the last part is, on Moscow's fair and famous town, where fell the first Napoleon's crown, it made a direful swoop. The rich, the poor, a high, the low, alike the various symptoms know, alike before it droop. That was written about the influenza pandemic of 1890. It was written by Winston Churchill. The sad thing is 
but this time it's not the rich, the poor, the high, the low alike. The sad thing is this time the effects are unequal. But the thing I can say with confidence is that the effect that those of us who have a proud behavioural science background in psychology and related disciplines are making a difference. And again, I would ask all of you to think about the impact we can have to bring the acute phase of this pandemic to an end. And let's be honest, to go back to what we would all wish more than anything else, to a life as we would like to lead it, uh, as we knew before this started. And I'll leave it there and we'll take some questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jane. Um, it's a wonderful, provocative, uh, expansive um, uh, and measured presentation um, from right at the coalface. So uh, as Jane said, she's prepared to take questions. Please um, either raise your digital hand or post it in the chat. While we wait for questions, perhaps I could, I could start. So near the end, you talked about where is psychology in all of this? And, and the answer is everywhere. Um, and perhaps by saying it's everywhere, that also means it's nowhere because it's not coalesced. It's not, it's not tangible, if you like. Um, and so a lot of the psychological evidence is uh, through you know, advertisers on the crew and transfer and, and the like. How do we get um, psychology and behavioral science expertise more visibly present at the table? So I, it, that is a really, really important question, Ian. And I think it's one of the things we need to start talking about because um, there are a range of actions that have been taken in the public health context that have their absolute roots in psychology as a discipline, and yet we don't talk about that. Um, as Russell said, I have said on many occasions that there was not a day, there is still not a day that goes by that I do not use uh, the, the training, the knowledge, and the experience I had in my degree. It is absolutely with me every day. And I will say, that the occasion on which somebody came to the, the secretaries board, which of course is the grouping of the departmental secretaries, which meets monthly, and we got a, a discussion, we had someone come and present to us on behavioral economics. And I looked sort of sagely down the table and said, after he'd given us rather a long lecture about the merits of um, you know, the dismal uh, discipline having discovered human behavior, I said, I should point out that I'm probably the only person around here with a psychology degree. He went, oh. And the truth of the matter is, we don't talk enough, to my mind, about psychology as a discipline. Uh, I've said previously, uh, I think there have been two federal ministers with psychology backgrounds, uh, one from each side of politics, uh, Professor Carmen Lawrence and Dr. Kay Patterson. Um, as it happens, I had the privilege of working with both of them. And I can tell you, uh, so Kay Patterson was the minister when I first became a secretary. And there is a framework of thinking that I think we all have, which we found, we found it very easy to discuss who we were and how we were going to tackle problems. But much as we have a chief nurse, much as we have people with particular backgrounds uh, on visible, visibly on, on the faculty, if I can describe it in that way, in the public policy debate. I think it is time we claimed some of this area as our own. I think so often we advise, but we don't acknowledge that the approach comes squarely from our discipline. So we should do something about it. I agree entirely. Let's, let's start a, an advocacy campaign right here. Well, forget Rally the Globe. Uh, we'll rally our colleagues first. Um, I have a question from, or a hand up from Gina. So let me just unmute you. Maybe yes, Gina. good morning. This is, um, I hope you can hear me. Yes. Yes, we can. You are. Wonderful. Uh, thank you, Jane. Uh, 
Russell and, and Ian for the, for the wonderful session today. I'm Gina Saman with the World Health Organization in Geneva. I used to work for Jane at the Department of Health and I'm also a psychology graduate. So it's, it's a wonderful opportunity to be with everyone today. Uh, Jane, very much welcoming your thoughts on the following. The COVID mm. pandemic will end. And the challenge we have as some of us continue then to prepare for future events is how do we prepare and sustain multi-sectoral and political engagement, leadership, interest in pandemic preparedness? What are some of your thoughts? Over. It's lovely, lovely to hear from you, Gina. And as you know, um, I enjoyed all of my time at the Department of Health, but I also enjoyed all the work I've done with the WHO and continue to do. And you're right, the term I did not use in, that, um, in those remarks was what we all know is a real risk cycle of panic and neglect. And it is a mystery to me, other than to think about it in the context that I outlined, which is this sort of rather strange bystander effect. And the fact that we, um, we are not able for some reason to process the very real presence of risk uh, and therefore take action as a world. So one of the things we have to do is to move now Whilst these impacts are real, whilst they're affecting uh, countries' budgets, they're affecting their citizens, while they're actually uh, experiencing the really the worst of this pandemic. I talked about the economic implications of this pandemic. One of the things, Jenny, you will recall that I always used to say from the health department's perspective is if we only talk about this from a health perspective, it's our problem. If we talk about the problem that we all have, the economists, uh, the people in the treasury, the people in governments around the world, then it's everyone's problem. So the work that's being done uh, by the global um, the monitoring board, the work that's been done by the World Bank, looking to the mechanisms we need, and Jenny, you'll know that there's a lot of discussion now about the possibility of a treaty. I sit on a group of concerned uh, people advocating for a treaty on this issue. Um, and that's more than the international health regulations, which in this particular case has not delivered us much. But the challenge is to convince all governments that it's in their interest. And the scale of this problem is, I think, one of the challenges we have in convincing people that they should participate. But let me give you a little number to think about. How much would it take to do the work to invest in pre-pandemic vaccines against the pathogens that we think are a worry? I'll answer the question. So to get them ready for a um, bit beyond phase one clinical trial, it's $3.5 billion US. Compare that to the trillions trillions of dollars that this pandemic has cost. And yet now, when I'm out talking to governments around the world, they stroke their beard, they're mainly blokes, and they go, oh, it's very difficult. We're entering a period of fiscal consolidation. You say our share is 100 million. Well, we might be able to give you 20. Now, that is really, um, really terrible. But just as with the bystander effect, we are asking some global leaders to champion this issue. And I should acknowledge um, the amazing global work done by former Chancellor Angela Merkel in Germany as a global leader in championing and rallying people. Um, I should also acknowledge that, and some of you may find this surprising, that Boris Johnson is actually championing our replenishment to actually raise funds for this scientific work. So Gina, there is no easy answer. It is going to take significant pressure, the engagement of those most senior leaders who can then reach out to their friends, who can make the point that people are deserving of this help and who can create the global mechanisms, including the financing mechanisms, so that we are ready to go when this happens again. Thank you for that question, Gina. There's a question in the chat box from James Kearney, which I'll read. Increasingly, conspiracy theories and theorists 
seem to be dismissing valuable and valid evidence, largely based on the source of the information. Have the changing attitudes toward expert organizations emerged as concern for the organizations with which you work? And the answer to that is very much yes. Um, one of the, the challenges uh, with the conspiracy theories that we read, and some of this is about the personality type, I think, of the people, the sort of sense of individualism and the notion of agency and um, I won't be told and I won't do this because I don't think it's good for me with no concern for anybody else in their immediate vicinity. Together with talking down the risk and the use of inverted commas, alternative facts, those things I think are thoroughly pernicious and it is very much more challenging. In environments where the source of uh, commentary and information are relatively restricted, um, you do have some chance of putting out information that people will see as reliable. In a world where the communication channels are so multiple and varied and there are an echo chamber, as we know, the algorithms that are used on social media will repeat back to you what it thinks you want to hear, thus cementing yet further your views, which are often not founded in fact. And so what we have to do in this respect are several things. Firstly, we do have to uh, highlight people who are expert we have to ensure that they actually continue to talk to the community. And I do think, notwithstanding we're all a bit over press conferences, um, actually having our experts talk, um, sometimes for too long and sometimes in language which is a little inaccessible, but it's important that those experts keep delivering these messages. But you know what? Sometimes it's a person by person by person job. So all of us, who work in these fields, I say have an obligation. And one of the reasons I have taken more of a media role than would be the normal thing you'd see from a former public servant is because the job of delivering messages can be done one-on-one. -on -one. It can be done to a media audience. It can be done to governments. It can be, it can be done to countries. And it can be done around the world. And so all of us, I think, need to take the opportunity without vilifying and without denigrating to hear what people have to say and then talk with them sometimes about what their fears are in order that you can provide uh, some guidance and often a reference to where you might be able to get information and i know that i've, I've spent many a long hour talking to people one-on-one -on, -one on the phone um, i've done far too many media interviews and then I have um, been advocating globally. So I think each of us can take a role. But yes, it is a worry. Thank you, Jane. A uh, really important message there about the importance of um, tackling all these wicked problems on multiple fronts from the very immediate local all the way through to the global. global. But um, I think brings us to the end of questions and also to the end of our time conveniently. So it remains for me now to thank Russell for your uh, warm, generous introduction. And especially uh, thank you, Jane, Professor Halton, for a wonderful, stimulating uh, talk. Um, it is uh, a terrible shame that we can't be doing this in person. Mm. Um, and for you to be able to hear a resounding um, uh, round of applause. But uh, instead, can I ask everyone to clap your digital hands and um, thank you, Russell. Uh, and thank you thanks everybody for uh, attending, uh, a few questions, and I hope you all leave with uh, something that will stay bubbling away in your head for quite some time afterwards. So thank you very much, Jane. Uh, we'll let you get back to your dinner and um, on with your evening. That's my pleasure. And it would be um, remiss of me to say, if you haven't been vaccinated yet, please go out and protect your friends and your neighbours and get vaccinated. Indeed. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much, Jane and Russell and everyone Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay.